Thanks very much, Ben, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming here to listen to me tonight. Uh, I'll try and make it as interesting as possible. Uh, so I'm going to talk about critical raw materials for the energy transition. How's that? Okay, right, I'm, and I'm going to try and stand here, and I think I can walk to the tape over there. So hopefully this is going to work. So you can see up there a long list of names. And that's because all of the work that I do, it's not done by me, it's done by a whole big team of people that I collaborate with. And so uh, I just want to acknowledge that this is really a team effort whenever I give one of these talks. And I should also acknowledge that most of our research on critical raw materials has been done through four big projects funded by the UK's Natural Environment Research Council and by the European Commission. Nobody mentioned Brexit. <laughs> So, first of all, the big challenge that we have to face, you know, that we all have to face, the world has to face, and that's climate change. And I really like this representation that you can see behind me by a colleague, Ed Hawkins. It's just showing the global average annual temperature for each of the last 170 years or so as a color. So colder years are shown as dark blue, warmer years are shown as dark red, and it just shows that all of the hottest years on record have been this century. You know, climate change is a major issue that we do have to tackle, and we're seeing its impacts all the time nowadays with some of the extreme weather that we're seeing. But when I'm talking about climate change, what I really want to talk about is how we're going to mitigate the effects of climate change. And of course, this is from the IPCC's report that came out last year. This is just looking at some of the different technologies that we are adopting really fast. Renewable energy, so solar panels, uh, wind power, and then of course, electric vehicles. And this figure shows very nicely that adoption rates for those technologies are going up and their costs are coming down. So we are, we did a great job of moving over to green energy and green transport, the whole energy transition. And if you look at the rise of the electric vehicle, this is from the International Energy Agency, and it's pretty astounding, in fact. You go back to 2010, virtually no electric vehicles on our roads. And then you look at 2021, over 16 million electric vehicles led by China and then by Europe, but with other continents coming up fast and starting to adopt electric vehicles as well. So this is a massive change in how we get around. And what does that mean? Well, for us, as, certainly for me as a geologist, it means this. I think this is a great quote from Sally Manley and others in Nature in 2017. A transition to a low carbon society will require vast amounts of metals and minerals because the world cannot tackle climate change without an adequate supply of raw materials for all of these technologies that we need. And I think will and cannot are really important words there. This isn't a, oh, maybe we can manage. This is a definite, we need those metals and minerals if we're to use those technologies that will enable us to tackle climate change. And then the quote at the bottom, you know, a really one that I've heard many times over many years, if it can't be grown, it must be mined. But it's true. You know, we can't just create all of these technologies out of thin air. So when I talk about critical raw materials for the energy transition, I'm talking about a whole range of different raw materials, although I will go into more detail on a couple of them. But here's some examples of what we're talking about. First of all, batteries. Every electric vehicle needs a battery. And those batteries, uh, they can be slightly different chemistries depending on exactly what you choose. But at the moment, dominantly, they need lithium, cobalt, graphite, manganese, and nickel. And if you want to store energy, there's another set of batteries, battery types that will need vanadium. And batteries are a huge driver at the minute because as we've just seen, electric vehicles are being taken up so rapidly. But then also motors. So the motors that drive wind turbines and also that drive many electric vehicles, they need high strength magnets. And those high strength magnets contain the rare earth elements. 
We'll look at which rare earth elements in more detail shortly, but in particular, neodymium, dysprosium, and praseodymium. Those are the ones that you find in the magnets. Then there's hydrogen. You'll hear people talking about the hydrogen economy as though this is a great answer for dealing with a lot of our energy needs. If you want to make green hydrogen by electrolysis, you need to use an awful lot of platinum group metals, a huge amount, in fact. So we can't say that, oh, well, hydrogen doesn't have these issues because it does. Then what about solar panels? They need gallium, indium, tellurium, and selenium, weird and wonderful elements that most people have never even thought about where they would come from. For the bodies of those electric vehicles, you need alloys, and those alloys have to be light yet strong. And that means you need some of the most modern alloys, including things like aluminium, of course, niobium, magnesium, and titanium. And then, of course, all of this, everything's electrifying. We need an awful lot of wiring, for example. We need a lot of copper. We need zinc, we need silver, we need silicon, we need a whole range of other raw materials. So that's a vast range of raw materials that we're going to need. And just going to, again, this is from the International Energy Agency from a report on the role of critical minerals in clean energy technologies. And they compared the amount of minerals that would be used in green technologies as opposed to those in traditional technologies. And if you look up here at uh, the cars, and an electric car needs more than four times as much mineral and metal material as a conventional car does. That's because, of course, you don't have a tank full of hydrocarbons, you have a battery. And that battery is made up of all the things we just talked about, nickel, cobalt, graphite, manganese, and lithium. Similarly for power generation, again, wind in particular, wind turbines need an awful lot more minerals and metals than power generation by, for example, coal or natural gas. So the amounts of these different minerals that we're going to need are increasing substantially. And if we look at staying with the International Energy Agency, they looked at mineral demand for clean energy technologies by a couple of different scenarios. So different scenarios about how fast we might decarbonize globally. And they showed that uh, by 2040, depending on exactly which scenario we follow, we're going to be looking at four times four, I'm not getting much laser pointing, I'll try not to do that. Four times to six times as much minerals needed for green technology, green technologies and green energy by 2040. And then they looked at the potential growth in demand for selected minerals. Now, this is a pretty out there estimate, and some of the other estimates for the growth in demand are smaller. But look at that, they think lithium is going to, we're going to need 40 times as much lithium in 2040 as we needed in 2020. That's pretty crazy. Other estimates say, well, only five times as much. It's probably somewhere in the middle of that. The point is, that's an awful lot more raw material that we're going to need. Graphite, cobalt, nickel, the rare earths, we're going to need a lot more of all of them. One point I will make on this is just about the scale of these markets, because sometimes we do need to remind ourselves about this. I hope you can all see this diagram. The left-hand side is a representation of the scale of all metal that we mine in the world every year. And the whole lot of it that is pink is iron ore, which is mined mostly, of course, for steel production and for a whole range of other uses. 3,000 million tonnes of iron ore mined worldwide every year. That's not going to increase very much, but hey, it's not going to change. That blue box up there is all the other metals that we mine. And of those, we're looking at things like aluminium, manganese, and chromium, tens of millions of tonnes every year, copper, zinc. But when you get to things like lithium, cobalt, the rare earth elements, and the platinum group elements, we're actually only looking at maybe hundreds of thousands of tonnes of these, uh, these raw materials being mined every year. So we are looking at the smaller markets growing really quickly, but still, it's still an incredible amount of growth that we're going to need. Now, I like to head off this question before uh, I get too far into the talk. The circular economy. A lot of people will say, well, surely we're just going to recycle. 
And that's right, of course. Uh, I'm going to talk several times about these kind of steps you need to explore, then you need to mine, you need to process your raw materials, then you produce something that can be used by manufacturers. It's manufactured, it's used, and finally, it's probably scrapped and it can be recycled. But at every step along that way, there's going to be waste. It's never perfect. You're never going to get to the point where everything that you mind comes back and can be recycled. So the circular economy is never going to be perfectly circular. But of course, recycling is going to be massively important. Uh, certainly by the end of this century, I would hope we're going to have a pretty circular economy for batteries, for example. But just think about, I don't know, how old are your cars? Do you have a car that's maybe 10 years old, perhaps? You know, I certainly did until recently. If you think about it, 10 years ago, there were very few electric vehicles on the roads. So virtually every electric vehicle that's been made is probably still in use. So there's no batteries out there to recycle at the moment, or really not very many at all. And go back to the International Energy Agency again, they looked at how much can recycling contribute specifically for the battery raw materials? And they show that by 2040, if you look at the yellow dots and you look at the percentages, you can see that we'll be lucky if for any of these raw materials in 2040, 10% of what we need is coming from recycling. So recycling is going to be really important in the future, but right now it's not the answer or it's not all of the answer. And so that means, and this is good for us as geologists, over the coming decades, mining is going to be absolutely essential to provide the raw materials that we need for the energy transition. So I talked about the steps in the mining value chain. And again, here they are. First of all, you have to explore for your raw material, for deposits of your raw material. Then you have to extract it, you have to mine. Then you have to go through mineral processing, so intensive chemical engineering. Then you produce something you can sell to manufacturers who will then manufacture the components, say the cathodes that then go into the battery pack. Then that goes into the electric vehicle, it gets used, and finally it gets to the end of its life. Now I'm a geologist, so I'm mostly going to talk a bit about the exploration side of that and just give you a bit of a flavor of some of the work that's going on in understanding the geology, the resources, and how we go about exploring for a couple of my favorite raw materials. And just to kind of highlight exploration up there, it looks like, oh, it sounds simple, doesn't it? Exploration. But in reality, we're talking about first finding that mineral deposit, working out where it is, then characterizing it, producing a resource estimate, so you have grade and tonnage, You've got a lot of information about it. In Canada, it will have to comply with NI43101. Even when you've done that, you have to do extensive planning and permitting. You need increasing levels of investment. And all of this can take several years to decades. So exploration is something that is a huge part of this life cycle, and we really need to be able to move to that energy transition. So let's look at a couple of different raw materials that I've been working on over the last 15 years or so. And we'll start with the rare earth elements. Now, rare earth elements is a term that gets quite mixed up all too often. People will say rare metal or rare earth, and then they'll say like cobalt. This is not true, of course. The rare earth elements are the 15 lanthanides sit across the bottom of the periodic table in your chemistry textbook, the scandium and yttrium. And they all come together. Chemically, they're very similar. Uh, they, you typically find them all together in a deposit, just in different ratios. They're used in a range of technologies. They can be used in kind of the clever glasses on your touchpad screen. They can be used in luminescence. They'll be rare earths in this laser pointer. But most importantly, they're used in those magnets for motors. And particularly, most important of all, one rare earth, neodymium. That's the, the banker, if you like, in any rare earth deposit. And I'm going to say up front, because I have to say it somewhere, 
They may be called rare earth elements, but they are not that rare. There's no real shortage of them. They come in a, a range of different geological types of deposits, uh, some formed by high temperature geological processes, principally igneous processes. So you find them in alkaline igneous rocks and carbonatites. Weird and wonderful igneous intrusions with strange mineralogy, but things that we know to exist in many places across the world. And then they come in deposits that are formed by low temperature geological processes. And this is actually where a lot of the world's rare earth elements are mined. You find them in mineral sands, which are mined all over the world for a range of things. You find them in laterites, so tropically weathered soils. And what we find there is that the rare earths have been released from their host minerals and they are adsorbed onto clay surfaces as ions. So they're actually quite easy to extract. This is how China produces a lot of rare earth elements. And we also find them in weathered carbonatite. And they are often mined as byproducts of things that are much more commonly mined around the world. Niobium, iron, as we know, you know, the biggest metal that we produce, aluminium and phosphate. But the most important thing about the rare earth elements and the thing that means they're in the news regularly is that their production is dominated by China. And this will be figures from a couple of years ago now, but it shows China more than 80% of all production of the rare earth elements. And then next to that, you can see Burma or Myanmar. Now, actually, the mines in Myanmar are right on the border, right on the Chinese border, and any mining in Myanmar goes straight into China. So it is mining in another country, but it's effectively Chinese mining. Some mining in the USA, some in Australia, and then a few other countries. Mostly, China is incredibly dominant in mining of the rare earth elements. Now, let's unpick that a little bit more. And this red line here shows you the price of neodymium oxide, so the price of one of the rare earth elements, from 2000 at the bottom to 2020 over here. And just highlights a few of the things that have happened in that time. So if we go back before the start of this graph, back to the 1980s, most of the world's rare earth elements were produced at the US, in the USA, mountain pass in California. The yellow bars up there show you when mountain pass was open. So in the early 2000s, that mine closed. And it closed because China was producing rare earth elements principally from one very large mine by Anobo. And that was providing all of the rare earth elements the world needed. So China had total control at that point. You can see prices were fairly low. But in 2010, the Chinese government did something really significant. They tightened export quotas on the rare earth elements. Now, it didn't really actually make that much difference to global markets, but it spooked an awful lot of people. And you can see just how much the prices jumped up. Really high spike in prices. Now, two things actually brought that down again fairly quickly. One, the realization that the export quotas weren't really an issue because everyone was still getting the rare earth elements they needed. And two, the fact that there was a mine in Australia, Mount Weld, that had been moving towards opening for some time. And in fact, did open in 2012 uh, and helped bring those prices down again. But what that did was it drove exploration all over the world for the rare earth elements. Everybody got excited, went out there and started exploring. And it also led to us getting funded to do quite a lot of research. So here you can see um, the E-Rare, SOS Rare and Hypercount Car projects that we were funded to work on between 2013 and 2020. So that was all pretty good. You can also see that Mountain Pass reopened, closed again, reopened, is still open. Um, Interestingly, loads of exploration, plenty of research. What didn't happen was any significant new mines opening. Pretty much all of the new major rare earth element mines that opened in this period from 2010 to 2020 were in China, of course. Mines, the mines that managed to get open in other countries 
were either very small or it was mines that were already mining, let's say, niobium and managed to produce some rare earth elements as a byproduct until 2021. Here in Canada, Nechilacho did begin to produce in 2021. Now it's only producing small amounts and it is quite some way from being a large scale mine, but it is the first hard rock new mine that's opened since 2012 and that is not in some way connected to China, well, as unconnected as it can be in the rare earth supply chain. So Canada is leading the way here. So looking at where all those rare earth element deposits that have been explored are around the world, you can see that the answer is pretty much everywhere. Now, this is a map you can download from our website uh, for free. It's, it's due an update and we will be updating it soon, but at the moment, this is the May 2021 map. The bigger dots on here show you where there are rare earth element mines. We've got Mount Weld here. Um, we've got Mountain Pass in California over there. We've got uh, a bit of mining in Brazil as a byproduct of niobium, Madagascar as a byproduct of titanium, tiny mine in Burundi, uh, in Russia as a byproduct of phosphate, and then China and Southeast Asia is where the, the focus is for the rare earth element mines. But you can see that there are deposits of a range of different types, going by different colors pretty much all over the world. And there's certainly more known to add to this map since it was created. So just to say again, the rare earth elements are not rare. And actually because of all the research that's been done and all the exploration over the last 10 to 15 years, we're starting to get a pretty good picture of the geology of these deposits. This is a, a figure from a paper that we published last year led by uh, Charlie Beard, a colleague of mine. And it doesn't show up brilliantly on there, but hopefully you can see it's a kind of three-dimensional impression uh, of an igneous intrusion, so a cut through an alkaline igneous intrusion, which is, a, if you like, an exemplar of what a rare earth deposit might look like. Um, and there's a lot more detail, of course, in the paper. We've been able to just get a good picture for how the different components of that intrusion might relate to each other in terms of the mineralization of the rare earth elements. We've got a lot of information that guides exploration models now for the rare earth elements. And there are a lot of large deposits out there that are well characterized for the mining codes. But if you look in the newspapers, you will find we are still concerned about securing our supply of the rare earth elements. And of course, the issues are not just geological. Many of those issues are social, economic, environmental challenges, engineering and processing. These are the sorts of issues that are the problem, not knowing where the rare earth elements are. But it's funny how the media still think that finding, I quote, a new rare earth element deposit is big news. Donald Trump wanted to buy Greenland so that he could find some new rare earth deposits. <laughs> so we, I've talked to a lot of journalists recently. In July, the Turkish government sent out the Ministry of Mines and said, we've discovered an incredible tonnage of rare, no, they said reserves. We discovered incredible reserves of the rare earth elements, 694 million tons, they said. We've discovered this. Couple of problems with that. First of all, 694 million tons of what? You've got to give the grade and talk about what the deposit is. They didn't do any of that. None of that information was forthcoming. However, they didn't name the deposit, but it so happened that some of us knew it pretty well. I've been there. We even published a paper on it quite recently. It wasn't a discovery at all. You know, it was just a bit of publicity because they had a bit more data on it. And the world's media sucked it up. And then just in the last couple of weeks, Sweden. Now, this is a different situation because this is LKAB, a big mining company, mining ore and the mining iron ore in the north of Sweden. And they have, what they've done is characterize a deposit that contains the rare earth elements 
and announced a properly characterized resource, 585 million tonnes at 0.18% total rare earth oxides. They say it's the largest in Europe. That does depend how you define Europe. If you pop out Turkey and Greenland, then they're probably right. They announced the resource and the headline said, Sweden finds rare earth deposits. Except there's an awful lot of research out there already about that rare earth deposit. It's very well known. Lots of papers published on it. It's not a find at all. It's just been better characterized. And the reason why they're not just producing rare earth elements as a byproduct of iron ore in that mine, it's down to mineralogy. I was always going to get to mineralogy at some point. I'm sorry, uh, always happens. But mineralogy is vitally important when we're talking about these critical raw materials. Because the rare earth elements, of course, they don't occur as native elements. Obviously, they are in minerals, in rocks, intergrown with a bunch of other minerals that you may not want to mine at all. And there are an awful lot of minerals out there that contain the rare earth elements. This list is just a few of them. And the really interesting thing about the rare earth is look at the complexity of some of those formulae. Some of these are so complex, you have to process them. You have to separate the mineral from all the other minerals. Then you have to extract the rare earths from the mineral. And then you have to extract each of the different rare earth elements from the others. It's really, really complicated. And so in fact, around the world, we only really mine three of all the possible rare earth element minerals. Basnezite, nice simple carbonate. Monazite, pretty simple phosphate. And xenotene, again, a pretty simple phosphate. All these other minerals and many, many more beside that contain the rare earth elements, we might, there might have been research to try and understand how to process them to get the rare earths out of them. But that research has never gone to commercial scale. And in Sweden, at Karuna, the rare earth elements are in appetite. And the reason why no one's producing the rare earth elements in Northern Sweden is because the processing is not that simple. A lot of research has been done. I'm sure they will get there, but they've not got there yet. None of this, of course, was in the media reports. The other problem is radioactivity is a potential issue. Uh, in particular, monazite and xenotene are often quite rich in thorium and uranium. So mineralogy is really, really critical when it comes to most of these critical raw materials. If there's any students here who are thinking mineralogy classes, those are a bit boring. Think again, because it's so important. So that's the rare earth elements, except that I just want to highlight something about this using the life cycle of a mineral discovery. This diagram is from Visual Capitalist. And I just want to talk about where the rare earth elements are on this diagram. So we've got a timeline along the bottom which can be 15 years. That's the timeline from starting exploration until you actually open a mine. And then we've got the value of your mineral deposit going up there. And at the start, you know a little bit about your deposit, not very much, you have a bit of information, you're trying to get investment. Eventually you get decent investment, you do some drilling, you maybe prove a, you get a resource estimate that's code compliant, great. And you've got to uh, the point up here where it's a discovery and the laser point is not helping, so. An awful lot of rare earth element deposits got to that point uh, in the period after 2010. So we know an awful lot about them. But then after that, you have to get money. You have to get a lot of investment to actually build a mine. You have to get over this dip and up there to an operating mine. And for the vast majority of rare earth element deposits around the world, they've never got through that dip. Uh, Kizoljorin, the Turkish example, is actually at that peak right now. And because the Turkish government is going to put money into it, maybe it will get through that dip, we'll have to see. Nechinacho is on its way out of that dip, but it's not yet at a full scale operating mine. Again, we'll have to see. And in terms of the things that have actually got to being an operating mine, we're talking about a pretty small number of rare earth deposits. Okay. So the rare earth elements were the story of the 2010s. 
we've learned a lot about them. We don't have many new mines. China still controls the rare earth elements around the world. What about lithium? Lithium is the story of the 2020s because we're seeing this huge rise in electric vehicles. And this diagram is for our map. We have a, a UK Critical Minerals Intelligence Centre at BGS. And uh, this diagram is from one of the reports produced there. Again, you can go and pick it up. Um, and this shows global lithium production and prices starting now in 2010. We don't need to go back further than that. And the black line is prices. So you can see from 2010 to about 2015, lithium kind of bumbled along. Production was evenly balanced between Australia and Chile and Argentina. I'll come back to that in a moment. And then in 2016, there was a realization that actually we needed these batteries. We we're going to need more lithium. Prices went up a bit. And what happened was Australian producers were able to ramp up very quickly. So the orange bar is Australia. And you can see that Australian producers produced a lot more lithium. And that was enough to keep things going for a while, probably till about 2020. And it's really only in the last couple of years, for which we don't have production data yet, it's really only in the last couple of years that we've recognized that existing producers simply are not going to be able to provide all the lithium the world's going to need. And as that recognition of a gap between available supply and demand has really crystallized in people's minds, prices have gone like that. Now, it may just be a spike like it was with the rare earths, but I'm not sure it will be, because in this case, it's not really a political driver, it's genuine demand for lithium. So right now, lithium is the, the, the raw material that everyone is interested in. Now, where do we get our lithium? Just the same as with the rare earth elements, there's two different types of deposits. There's the hard rock deposits again, the igneous rocks, so pegmatites and granites, I'm gonna talk a bit more about those. Uh, there are examples really all over the world in Australia where they're being mined extensively, in Canada where the Tanko pegmatite has started mining lithium again fairly recently, uh, in Zimbabwe, which is where the picture at the top is, all over the world. There's also volcano sedimentary deposits, so deposits formed in ancient lakes and sedimentary basins. There's some really high profile examples, Yadar in Serbia, Thacker Pass in Nevada, these are not doing too well in terms of getting developed at the moment. We will come back to that. But essentially, these are often areas where you've got good agricultural land. That's difficult. Then there's brine deposits. Lithium likes to go into water. So it can be leached out of rocks fairly easily into brines. We have really significant production from the salars or salt flats in the Andes. Chile, Argentina, Argentina, also big resources in Bolivia. But then we have geothermal brines circulating underground, for example, in Cornwall in the UK, and our oil field brines, of course, right here in Alberta, uh, all of which have the potential for lithium extraction. So again, lots of different deposits. And again, there is nothing rare about lithium. On this map, you will see the colors are not quite as widely distributed as they were for the rare earths. The blues and yellows that you see chiefly down the western coast of the Americas are the, the brines and the volcano sedimentary deposits. Uh, we also have brines being mined in China. But this western coast here is the really important area for that deposit type. And then all the reds all over the world are the pegmatites and granites. There are plenty of deposits of this kind in any ancient collisional belts or areas of ancient crust around the world. And while there appears to be a gap in Russia and Central Asia, that is very much an absence of evidence and not an evidence of absence. We know that we're pegmatites there. We just don't know where to put them on the map because we don't have those data. This map really will be revised pretty soon because there is so much more to add to it because there is so much lithium exploration going on now because everyone is so interested in lithium. The interesting thing, however, is that we know a lot less about lithium deposits than we do about rare earth element deposits. We haven't had the same level of research and exploration before really only a handful of years ago. 
And also, those of you who are involved in geochemistry uh, will be fully aware that lithium is not the easiest element to measure. You can't just take your portable XRF and get your lithium contents. So we don't always have brilliant lithium data, uh, even for areas that are otherwise quite well known. The brines are a bit different. This is from uh, work by Leanne Monk and the USGS team back in 2016. I'm not going to go into detail on this because the brines are not so much my area. I've got hydrogeology uh, colleagues who do that work. Uh, but we've got a pretty good understanding of how the salars form, for example, uh, and how the brines circulate within those salars. What's very difficult to do is to get a proper resource estimate because, hey, it's brine, it moves. What I am going to talk about a bit, because this is my current real area of research, is the lithium pegmatites. And anyone who's not heard of pegmatites before, trust me, in 10 years' time, you'll have heard an awful lot about them, because these are our main source of lithium from Australia and increasingly will be from many other countries around the world. Pegmatites, they're igneous intrusions. They were emplaced as very volatile rich magmas, uh, probably small number of kilometers beneath the Earth's surface. Uh, they're typically tabular, so they'll be sheets of igneous rock, uh, meters to tens of meters thick, rarely hundreds of meters thick. Uh, they can be flat lying or they can be steeply dipping. And this is an example here at the Petita mine in Zimbabwe. You can see the white pegmatite standing out against the dark colored country rocks. They're typically hosted in metasedimentary or metamorphosed mafic rocks, but they can be hosted in nearly anything. They are found in areas where you have had continental collision and metamorphism. That's where you tend to find them. They'll typically have sharp contacts and they often have, they have very large crystals. They often show a whole range of really interesting textures. I'm not gonna go into detail on that, but I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. And they can be zoned. And this is really interesting because the classic idea is what's shown up there. This is a paper from Mike Wise and others from the Smithsonian, published in Canadian Mineralogist last year. The classic idea is that you just have a border, you have a wall zone that's not very mineralized, and then you have a core that is full of mineralization and that it's really simple. That's maybe not true. Sometimes they are very simple, but often you have this really complex set of different minerals back to mineralogy again, and uh, different textures. They're not at all simple things to understand, and no two pegmatites that I've seen are quite the same. And we have a really big question. We do not really know how these lithium pegmatites form. And that's really important if you want to go out there and explore for a mineral deposit. If you don't know how something forms, then you don't know where to go to start looking for it. Now, some of you are probably thinking, hang on, of course we know how they form. There is a classic model for how all pegmatites form, and that's that you have a big mass of granite, a big granite intrusion, and that as that granite cools and crystallizes, it leaves behind magmas that are ever more enriched in a range of what we call incompatible elements, like lithium, and that eventually, those very volatile rich, often very metal rich magmas will escape from the granite, will be emplaced as pegmatites, and you will be able to go about three kilometers from the edge of the granite body on the map, and you will find your lithium pegmatites. That's the classic model. The other model that more and more people are thinking to be correct is an anatexis model, which says you don't need a granite, you need a lithium rich source, so a sedimentary rock, for example, and you need to melt it in a zone of continental collision, a process that we know goes on all the time. So partial melting of sedimentary rocks, we know that happens, we know it forms pegmatitic uh, intrusions because we can go and see it in many places around the world. Migmatites, I'm going to look at Dave Patterson here. Um, now these two models, there's actually quite a lot of fighting going on at the moment between two different groups that espouse the two different models, not physical fighting, in the literature fighting. Um, but in reality, 
as is always the case in geology, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle because these are always complex systems. But we have to understand these processes if we are going to explore for lithium pegmatites. We're not gonna be able to find them otherwise. And at the minute, we don't really understand those processes. And then, huh, there's something else, isn't there? Yay, mineralogy, of course, because just the same as with the rare earth elements, mineralogy is hugely important. Each pegmatite will contain different lithium minerals. We have some idea of the controls on why it might contain one mineral, why it might contain another. Some of it's to do with pressure and temperature. Some of it's to do with fluids. There's all sorts of different, different things that may be controlling that. But again, here's a range of lithium minerals. And right at the top, spodumene, a lithium aluminium silicate that really doesn't take up very many impurities. If you want to process a mineral to get lithium out for batteries, what you really want is spodumene. All the others, not so good. Petalite typically goes to ceramics. Lipidolite, which is a lithium mica, full of fluorine. It's difficult to process to give you the lithium that you need for batteries. Yes, people are trying to do it. The emphasis being on trying. None of these other minerals are currently being processed at commercial scale for lithium for batteries. So you need to find spodumene. If you're lucky, you might get tantalum, tin, and cesium in association with it. Again, we don't really understand as yet why you get spodumene in pegmatites rather than any of the other not so useful lithium minerals. So again, we need a lot more research to try and get our heads around that. So I'm just going to give you a little idea of some of the work we are doing at the moment to try and address some of these questions. And I'm gonna just talk briefly about um, some field work I was doing just a few weeks ago. So we've been in Ghana. Uh, and the reason we've been in Ghana is because West African geology is absolutely ideal for looking at all these hypotheses. So if you look at this map here, this is the West African craton, very simplified. Apologies for all the numbers. I've lifted that out of a paper that we published a few years ago. All those pale greens, they're greenstone belts. So belts of, that are rich in sedimentary rocks and volcanic rocks. They're actually also very rich in gold. These are some of the world's major gold mineralization areas. And then the kind of pale pinks, their granites associated with them. So West Africa is a great place to go and look at different possible sources for lithium pegmatites. And it is highly prospective for lithium. Lots of pretty advanced exploration projects. These are the guys who are, we've been working with, Atlantic Lithium in Ghana. And they've given us a lot of support to go and do field work in this area. And uh, this is the area we've been working here in Ghana, just west of Accra but easy to get to. This is, I'm sorry, a very simple map. We only finished this field work a few weeks ago and I wasn't going to work too hard on this over Christmas. Uh, but this is an area, a part of the coast of Ghana. The pinks are granites, the yellows are sedimentary rocks, the greens are metavolcanic rocks. The black crosses are the names of places where we've been and all the red dots are our samples. And there's loads of pegmatites along this coast. And the really interesting thing is the variation in mineralogy, of course. Here at Winbar, where it says SPD, nice spodumene pegmatites. Here at Oya, where Atlantic Lithium are working, nice spodumene pegmatites. In between, pegmatites with virtually no lithium in at all. Why is that? We don't know the answer. And those are the sort of questions that we have to answer to try and develop decent exploration models for lithium pegmatites. And just to show you some pictures here, this is just a, a few weeks ago, end of November, beginning of December. It's not the clearest, but I hope you can see in these two pictures here, we've got pegmatites actually within granite and they're kind of anastomosing networks of pegmatites going all over the place, no sharp contacts, no lithium there, no interest at all. Then up here, my colleague Salam has got his hand on a beautiful sharp contact 
on this side, metavolcanic rocks, on this side, pegmatite. Enormous, great big pegmatite, tens of meters across, really sharp contacts, fantastic. No lithium. Quite a bit of interest for things like beryl and tantalum, but no lithium in that one. And then down here, in a quarry that's being quarried for roadstone and taking it away and putting it on the roads, amazing spodumene pegmatites. And this uh, rock face here has big crystals of spodumene, lithium ore, like this. And these are all within a few kilometers of each other. So these are the sorts of questions we're trying to answer. I can't give you any answers that don't have any. We only just got our samples back a few weeks ago and we haven't really even looked at them yet. But this is the sort of work that we're trying to do to try and help explore for lithium and try and uh, move that along so that we have that better understanding of those deposits. So, we talked about exploration. We know where many of the deposits of the critical minerals are. We know that there's been uh, a lot of exploration for the rare earths and now happening for lithium. Uh, we know we've done a lot of research. We're getting a much better idea of the geology and of the geomodels. And in tandem with that, there's been work on the mineral processing, trying to improve the methods for mineral processing. This all sounds good, right? It should mean that we should be able to secure our supply chains of these minerals and the media shouldn't have to be constantly worrying and asking questions. But that's not how it goes. Because there are a lot of other issues to do with mining and supply chains of these minerals, and they are issues that we as geologists don't really have any control over. And I'm just going to finish by taking a quick look at some of those things. Because we're talking about politics, economics, social and environmental concerns. Let's start with the first two. I'm not going to talk for long about politics and economics. I don't want to go there. But if we if we go back to our supply chain again, and now we've got a figure from a, a report done by my colleagues that again, you can pick up from the BGS website. Again, if we look at extraction or mining, as we've just seen, ultimately that has to happen where the resources are. Uh, so there are some countries that will do a better job of getting mines open than others, but ultimately you have to go to where the resources are. And so for example, for lithium, you're going to Australia, Chile, and Argentina. Right. And then you've got to get that mineral processed so that you can extract the raw material you need. And I think you all know where most of the world's mineral processing is for lithium, for the rare earth elements, and for almost everything else, China. China controls that step in the supply chain for nearly all of the critical raw materials that we need for the energy transition. China, of course, also has a big part in a lot of the manufacturing. They have major industry, so they have their own supply chains all sewn up. But as you get down towards, for example, batteries, then you start having more manufacturing around the world. Uh, and so, of course, a whole range of different countries need to secure their supply chains to get those raw materials. And if they want to get them without going through China, that means building a whole new supply chain from scratch. And of course, we're seeing policy change now. The UK has released a critical mineral strategy. Not that much has happened so far. Canada's released a critical mineral strategy and the Canadian government has put a bit more definitive action in, in terms of divesting from a foreign owned industry. But this is one of the big controls. Ultimately, we could do all the exploration we want, government policy, Politics and economics is a big control. And then the other big control on whether we can get these critical raw materials, whether we can have an energy transition, is around environmental and social perceptions. And you will have all seen this in the media, how the electric vehicle boom is draining communities on the planet. Mining can't cost the earth. Well, Mining can't cost the earth, but if we don't have it, we're not in a great situation either. And then uh, mines, potentially big lithium mines that have lost their mining licenses are likely not going to be able to open because of, of local protests. 
Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute we should just have mining indiscriminately. We have to have mining and we have to do it well. That is my absolute message. And there are lots of things we can do to understand the impacts of mining. If you want to understand the global impacts, you do life cycle analysis. This is a hugely growing area now. Looking at all of the impacts, this is from a paper we published in 2021 with Rob Pell, who now runs a company doing exactly this. And uh, you look at the impacts, for example, you look at the CO2 emissions of all the steps in exploration, in mining, in processing, everything. You can take it through all the way, if you like, to the end of life of that project. This is really important for understanding global impacts. When someone says, well, there's no point in having electric vehicles, their emissions are as bad as those of petrol vehicles. It's this kind of work that gives you the data that says that's not true. Electric vehicles over their lifetimes still have less em emissions than pet petrol vehicles. And then you can do work like this. This is looking at different types of lithium mining. Down here we have brine, and over here we have spodumene. So if we're just looking at CO2 emissions, we should be getting all our lithium from brine because it's a lot less damaging to the sort of global environment than mining from spodumene. Problem with that is it comes into contrast with local perceptions because whereas in Australia, the lithium mines in general are well-managed, well-governed, and not causing too much concern, the salars in Chile and Argentina are causing a lot of concern because ultimately you are taking out water. Those brines are water and you're evaporating water to concentrate the lithium. So there's a lot of concern about the impacts on the water cycle in those areas. So the global impacts at CO2 emissions are not the only important things. We also need to understand the local impacts. And now, of course, Local impacts of mining can be bloody awful if it's not well managed, if communities are not consulted, yeah, it can be terrible. But we never talk about the good stuff. We never talk about the mines that get it right. So this is some work that one of my PhD students did recently, looking at a nickel mine in Madagascar. Now Madagascar, I've been there a few times, it's an incredibly poor country and it's lost most of its natural forest, and it's lost it not because of logging or mining or any other big company. It's lost it because local people who live in Madagascar, they need something to build their homes with. They need something to cook their food over. They need somewhere to grow their rice. And so they cut down the forest because that's the easiest way. They use the resource that's available to them. So this nickel mine, which started about 15 years ago, made a commitment that they would employ local people, and then they would protect areas of forest that were equivalent to the footprint of the mine itself. In other words, they would ensure that there would be no net loss of forest due to that mine. And Katie, my PhD student, did a com completely independent assessment of that using some very clever environmental modeling that I don't even pretend to understand. And published in Nature Sustainability last year, the evidence that the mine is on track to do exactly what it said it would, that it would achieve no net loss of forest. That's great. And it even got into mainstream media. It's a Madagascar mine, the first to offset its destruction of rainforest. Well, actually, no, it's the first that somebody bothered to do an independent assessment of and publish on it and tell the media. So these kind of good examples of you know, mining can be done well, need to be out there so that the media, the public are more widely aware that mining doesn't have to be a bad thing. And in tandem with that, we need strong governance. We need mining to be done well. I've told some people from Rio Tinto what I thought of their situation in Australia, because I kept giving this talk and people would say, what about Rio Tinto? So to wrap that all up then, conclusions, if we're going to tackle climate change, we need electric vehicles, we need renewable energy, and to do that, we need a wide range of minerals and metals. And that is definite. We can't pretend that there is some kind of amazing battery for electric vehicles. 
or some kind of amazing way of making renewable energy that doesn't need those raw materials because it doesn't exist. Recycling is going to be hugely important, you know, and in decades to come, hopefully we will see a much more circular economy. But for now, recycling can't provide what we need because those stocks just aren't there to be recycled. So right now we have to mine. And these minerals are not scarce. The rare earth elements are not rare. There's plenty of all these things in the crust. We need to understand how to explore for them better. We need to do a better job of processing the minerals, back to that mineralogy. And we need to make sure the mining is done well, governed well, managed well. Public perception of mining is poor and kind of assumes that there's going to be local environmental degradation. So it is so important to show wherever possible that that doesn't have to be the case. So good governance and environmental management are a huge part of all of this. And of course, tie in to the politics, the economics and all of it. So my final message is we need mining. Let's do it as well as we possibly can. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks everyone. So we can, uh, we're gonna do the questions here. So if you are online, please put your questions into the Q&A box. I'm happy to read those to Catherine here. Uh, I really love that talk. And I really love, of course, the mention of mineralogy and how important that will be uh, into the future. I'm sure all of our students out there love that as well. Uh, so again, uh, we appreciate all of your questions. I'm gonna try to get through every one of them, but if we don't have time, I'm sure that you can email um, Catherine afterwards. So I'll start with a question from the room. Does anyone in the room have a question? Simone. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I want to get back to the hypothesis uh, about the genesis of the lithium deposit, mm -hmm. um, which uh, require strata and axis. In the case, why would we need uh, like actual pegmatites and not just any calcic intrusion to the crust to generate this deposit? If the source of the lithium is in this method. Ah, so um, lithium, of course, is it's very incompatible. If it, when you have sedimentary rocks that are rich in lithium, then that's fine as long as they're not heated, as long as they're not melted. Then absolutely, you'll have lithium clays or, or lithium borates, like we have at Yadar or at Thacker Pass. The problem is that actually finding them in the sedimentary rocks is not that easy. Yadar was discovered almost by chance because Rio Tinto was thrilling for borate. Uh, and then also the nature of these deposits means that actually they seem to have caused the biggest environmental concerns. But I'm sure there are plenty of lithium rich sedimentary rocks out there to be discovered. We just don't know where they are. However, once you melt them, then, or metamorphose them indeed, we don't really know, uh, lithium will, try very quickly to get out into any fluid or melt because it's very highly incompatible. And so what you need to pick out is the very small degree partial melts, the earliest partial melts that have concentrated the lithium. Once you get to an ordinary granite that's not that rich in lithium, the lithium will be, there will be some, but it will be in micas. And that's very difficult to process. So what we really want is Spodumene, ideally, you know, a mineral that is pretty enriched in lithium. And to get that, we just need the these, you know, either highly fractionated melts from a granite or very small degree partial melts from Castellan, Texas. So yeah, that's why it's trying to find those magmas in which the lithium is particularly enriched so that you get the right mineralogy. That's the aim. Excellent. I will follow that up with a question from Tom Gallagher, one of the sponsors of this event. Can you illustrate where the mineralogy of spodumene type pegmatites would fall on a Bowen diagram? <laughs> it's a, so actually, this is surprisingly quite simple because spodumene type pegmatite is a granite. You know, it's a, on many classic geochemical diagrams, it's a granite. You know, it doesn't, the, the thing that makes them different. I'm going to go briefly into some detail, geochemistry, maybe, 
The thing that makes them different is that they are rich in fluxing elements. And those fluxing elements may be lithium, maybe phosphorus, maybe fluorine or chlorine, could be water, could be boron, a whole range of different elements that will allow that melt to undercool. So what that means is when it's in place into the crust, it will get to the point where a granite would be crystallizing. And rather than crystallizing, because it's so rich in volatiles or fluxing elements, it will remain as a melt until it's cooled quite a lot further. And then it will reach a point where it starts to crystallize and they crystallize really fast. This is the thing we now know about phlegmatites. Anyone who's thinking, but they have big crystals, they must have cooled really slowly. This is, it's not true at all. So the thing about phlegmatites is that they are granites, but they are granites that are very rich in volatiles or fluxing elements. I say fluxing elements because if one of those fluxing elements is lithium, we have a lithium deposit. But on any classic geochemical diagram, it's a granite. Great. Uh, we have another question from the room. Uh, I will take you because I saw you first. Um, do you know if any work is being done? You mentioned in Chile that there's a lot of concern from local about water not being reclaimed or just completely lost. Is work being done to like, preserve the water or is it just not possible with the yeah, no. process? Great question. And actually loads of work is being done. In fact, I am um, I have a lithium project, research project called Lift. And we have people looking at all the different deposit types, and we have hydrogeologists looking at the salars and doing actually environmental and social ass assessment type work. My colleagues, Evie Petrovatsi and Andrew Hughes, have done a lot of work and have already started publishing quite a bit on that. Trying to understand the water cycles, trying to understand uh, how much impact the lithium extraction has. Uh, but then the other thing that's happening, and of course, this is the companies driving this. Is looking at whether there are ways to get the lithium out of those grounds without having to use solar evaporation, which is the mode by which the lithium is extracted at the moment. And uh, I was talking to somebody earlier about the fact that if you want to get lithium out of grounds, there is a technique called, well, there's a whole basket of techniques actually, which come under the name direct lithium extraction, which is often ion exchange type techniques. And several of these different techniques are being trialed by companies. Companies that want to get brine out of cellars, but also companies that want to work on geothermal and oil field brines. And so that's progressing. But the thing is that at the moment, there are very few companies that can do full on commercial scale direct lithium extraction. So it can be done at relatively small scales, no problem. But to replace the use of solar evaporation is going to need quite a lot more work, I think to get to that point. But yeah, so this is, it's recognized as being really important in the salads. And so there's loads of work going on trying to look at the impacts on the water cycle. Uh, the thing that's really interesting is that public perception says mining lithium means a problem with water. And so even when you go to the mine in the pegmatite, which is just, I, I always say to people, these mines are basically kitchen worktop mines. You know, ultimately, these pegmatites could be kitchen worktops. There are probably places in the world where they are kitchen worktops. But people assume that those have a massive impact on water supplies as well, which isn't necessarily true. Hey, thank you. Uh, so Megan Hollath online asks, do you believe that rare earth processing and mining, or perhaps even uh, exploration, is being held back because of the lack of metallurgical processes to extract them uh, from the minerals? Uh, for example, Mountain Pass and Mechilacho are both currently only processing bastonite, but mm -hmm. Mechilacho contains numerous other minerals, uh, which are difficult. So is it really the processing in the end? Which get, get to, yeah. No, that's absolutely right. The processing is, is so important. And uh, exactly as is it, Megan has said, you know, bastonite is a pretty easy mineral to process. And that's what is largely being processed in China. Uh, but there's a the whole range of other different rare earth minerals, which I've put up on the, on the slide. And some of those are really common. Alanite is the one that I always think about. Alanite is in all sorts of granites out there all over the world. We have masses of alanite. If we could process it for the rare earths, well, that would be great. It's in a lot of mineral sands that are already being mined, make it relatively easy. But we can't. 
at the moment. There's work going on to try and process all of these things. Alanite, apatite, eudialite, steenstropine. I can't even remember some of the names, you know, crazy mineral names. There's lots of work going on to try and deal with that processing. Um, but at the moment, it, it can't be done, it certainly can't be done outside of China at commercial scale. It's been done in many places at pilot scale, but it can't be done at commercial scale. So absolutely right, the question is, is completely spot on. Thank you. Uh, we had a question, I think, back there. Yes, um, the, uh, I, I'm thinking that lithium is not a normal uh, component or not much in a normal marine shale that we would be hearing about, uh, which suggests it's got the ad stored on the clay minerals from open water, the terrestrial lakes mainly. And but it still has to get in there from somewhere, so it's going from the surrounding local area. And does that bring us back to the original tectonic scope? So, you've hit on a really good point here, which is something, and I do sometimes show a sort of tectonic diagram that highlights this. It's the, the rare earths that you find absorbed onto clay mineral surfaces, and that's because the rare earths don't really want to go off into water. So, for example, where I worked in Madagascar, you have these weathered tropical soils, and the rare earths have stuck to the clays rather than going into the water that's constantly washing through those soils in the wet season. Lithium, on the other hand, will do everything it can to get into water. So, the lithium in the oceans is, is in the ocean, essentially. It will be in the brines for as long as it possibly can be. And uh, similarly, in lakes, like in the Salars, if there is water, it's very likely to be there in the brines. It's only when you finally get to the point where you've got has so much evaporation that you are starting to crystallize lithium salts, for example. So at Yadda, the lithium is in a borate mineral called Yadarite, which is a really unusual mineral. And that is evidence really of that being almost, if you like, a paleo salar, where you had that evaporation going on. So the lithium will do its best to stay in the water as long as possible, but eventually it will end up locked up in the clay minerals or in the borate. So it's not adsorbed on surfaces, it's actually in the minerals, but it will leach out again very quickly if it gets an opportunity. So the difference in terms of how lithium, lithium recirculates through the crust consistently, yes, some of it is inevitably coming off the subducting slab, but again, as soon as a slab starts to subduct and take sediments with it, the lithium will come off. The rare earth elements, on the other hand, they're sourced from the mantle and they are often, you know, we, we find them in association with those high temperature magmas. So different types of geological cycles. Thank you. I'm going to ask one last question from the online audience and then we'll probably have to go because we're getting near the end here. Uh, I think it's the next question from Josh Wells to conclude the night. What is Canada's potential when it comes to mining for elements associated with the energy transition? Top notch. Canada, Canada is in a brilliant position. You know, you have uh, superb geology. Uh, you have great resources of the rare earth elements, admittedly with some challenging mineralogy. You have great resources of lithium uh, and a host of other things. So yeah, Canada is in a great position. Um, you have, I think, politicians who appear to be aware of that looking from the outside. I wouldn't go any further than that. But yeah, Canada is in a great position. This is an area where Canada is, is likely to excel, I think. The, uh, the question will be around taking the whole supply chain and localizing that in the country, which I'm absolutely sure can be done. So yeah, it's, it's one of the best places in the world for doing that. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your questions.